In 1871, a small group of settlers from the French colony of Réunion arrived on Amsterdam Island, a remote, windswept speck in the southern Indian Ocean. Their mission was simple, to tame the land, grow crops, and raise livestock in isolation, far from disease and predators. But within just seven months, the harsh reality of the island drove them back to civilization. They left almost everything behind, including five cattle. To the farmers, abandoning the animals might have seemed inconsequential. The cattle, after all, were unlikely to survive. The island was no pastoral haven. It was cold, damp, and exposed to constant gales. Vegetation was sparse. Freshwater was limited. And yet, against all odds, the cows lived. And not only that, they thrived. Over a century later, researchers stepping onto the island were stunned to discover not a handful, but thousands of feral cattle roaming the highlands and ridges. These weren't just animals gone wild, they were something else entirely, products of evolution, shaped not by human hand, but by nature's relentless conditions. This is the story of the Amsterdam Island Cattle, an unintentional experiment in feralization, a debate between science and conservation, and a stark reminder of the unintended consequences that can unfold when humans leave nature to its own devices. Amsterdam Island spans just 55 square kilometers of volcanic relics shaped by wind, fire, and isolation. When farmer Hareton arrived with his team in 1871, he brought with him a vision to create a thriving agricultural outpost on the edge of the known world. Alongside his crops and tools, he unloaded four cows and a bull, livestock likely drawn from hardy European breeds such as Jersey or Breton Black Pied. But the settlers quickly discovered that life on Amsterdam Island was brutal. The volcanic soil resisted crops. The winds shredded structures. Rain was frequent, but drinking water remained scarce. The island, distant from trade routes and help, broke their spirits. Just months later, the settlers abandoned the mission and sailed home, leaving the cattle behind. That small decision would come to reshape the island in ways no one could have imagined. Left to their own devices, the cattle did not perish. They adapted. The island had no natural predators, and while food was limited, it wasn't non-existent. The cows became foragers, surviving on mosses, shrubs, bark, and the few available grasses. They migrated in search of water and shelter, learning to navigate the island's ridges and volcanic craters. In the absence of humans, the herd grew slowly at first, then exponentially. By the 1950s, scientists visiting the island reported not dozens, but hundreds of cattle. By the late 1980s, the population had ballooned to around 2,000. It was one of the most extreme examples of a domestic species reverting to wildness, a real-time case study in feralization. The cows had become more aggressive, wary of humans, and physically transformed. Over generations, they had shrunk in size, adapted behaviorally, and evolved genetically to suit the unforgiving island environment. While the survival of the cows fascinated scientists, their success came at a cost. Amsterdam Island was not empty. It hosted delicate ecosystems and endemic species found nowhere else on Earth. The island's forests of Filica arborea, crucial for soil retention and seabird nesting, suffered under constant grazing. The cows trampled vegetation, crushed seabird eggs under hoof, and disrupted native animal populations. Most critically, the Amsterdam albatross, an endangered seabird that nests only on this island, began to decline. What seemed like a thriving animal population to the casual observer masked a quiet ecological crisis. The cows, though impressive, were an invasive force. They were displacing species that had evolved in isolation for thousands of years. Despite the ecological damage, the cows presented a unique scientific opportunity. They had been isolated for more than a century, free from human breeding, veterinary care, and fences. It was a rare case of evolution unfolding in real time. Researchers observed dramatic changes in the herd. The cows were significantly smaller than their ancestors, dropping from an average of over 550 kilograms to just 410 kilograms, a textbook case of insular dwarfism, where island species shrink to survive on limited resources. Their coats had thickened, their hooves had strengthened, their social behavior had shifted. DNA studies in the 1990s and 2000s showed signs of inbreeding, but also adaptation. This was an evolution over eons, it was happening in decades. Every new calf carried traits better suited to Amsterdam's hostile terrain. The herd had become a new kind of cow, wild, resilient, and unlike anything else on earth. 
But this raised a difficult question. Should these animals be protected as a scientific treasure or removed to save the island they were destroying? By the late 1980s, the French government was forced to act. In 1987, officials erected a four-kilometer fence across the island to isolate the cattle in the southern half and protect the northern nesting grounds of seabirds. Between 1988 and 1989, over 1,000 cows were culled. Yet the problem persisted. For years, the debate continued. Conservationists demanded total eradication to preserve the island's ecosystem. Scientists pushed for alternatives, relocation, enclosures, even preserving a small breeding group. Animal welfare advocates joined in, arguing that the cows had earned their right to exist through sheer perseverance. But Amsterdam Island was remote, and moving such large animals presented logistical nightmares. The funding wasn't there. The political will wasn't strong enough. Finally, in 2007, the decision was made, all remaining cattle would be eliminated. Between 2008 and 2010, the last of the Amsterdam Island herd were slaughtered. With the cows gone, Amsterdam Island began to heal. Native forests began to regrow. Bird populations slowly recovered. The island's fragile ecosystem, long battered, had a chance to rebound. And yet, something profound was lost. The cows had become more than animals, they were a living testament to nature's adaptability. They demonstrated that evolution isn't just a theory of the distant past, but process that unfolds around us every day, often in unexpected places. They were survivors of neglect, symbols of resilience, and unwilling participants in a grand scientific story. Their story forces us to wrestle with uncomfortable questions. When science and conservation clash, which should prevail? Should we preserve the natural world at all costs, or make room for life's accidental wonders? The Amsterdam cattle weren't meant to be there. Their presence was a fluke of history. But their journey, from barnyards to volcanic cliffs, from human hands to wild herds, was extraordinary. They are gone now. But their legacy lingers, in research papers, in debates among ecologists, and in the windswept grass of a lonely island where evolution once danced in plain sight. Less than 20 years ago, a remote island in the Southern Ocean became the stage for one of the most dramatic conservation stories in modern history. It all started with a simple but disastrous mistake, the arrival of rats and mice. What followed was an environmental catastrophe few could have predicted. These rodents, left unchecked, unleashed a domino effect that nearly destroyed the island's fragile ecosystem. The place was Macquarie Island, often called the island that time forgot. Located between Australia and Antarctica, this narrow strip of land once flourished with life. Giant elephant seals sprawled across its beaches, while hundreds of thousands of royal penguins waddled ashore each breeding season. Further inland, vast meadows of tussa grass and towering megaherbs gave the landscape a prehistoric feel. The animals here had evolved in isolation for thousands of years without natural predators. Their behaviors reflected this innocence. Petrels, for example, nested in underground burrows with no fear of attack. But that isolation also made the island vulnerable. When seal hunters arrived in the early 1800s, they brought with them uninvited guests, rats and mice. These small stowaways quickly found paradise. No predators, plenty of food, and endless places to hide. They multiplied rapidly and began preying on the island's native species. Bird eggs, chicks, and even adult birds were devoured. Seeds and sprouts were eaten before they had a chance to grow. Insects disappeared. The finely balanced ecosystem began to unravel. In an attempt to control the rodent outbreak, cats were introduced. But rather than focusing on rats and mice, the cats turned to easier prey, defenseless seabirds that had never learned to fear them. The carnage was staggering. Cats killed tens of thousands of birds each year, hunting not just for food but for sport. Entire species vanished. The Macquarie Island Rail and the colorful island parakeet were both lost forever. By the mid-1900s, a new threat merged. In 1878, rabbits were introduced to provide emergency food for shipwreck sailors. Left without predators, they bred uncontrollably. By 1968, more than 100,000 rabbits were chewing their way through the island's vegetation. They stripped the land of its iconic plants, digging into the soil when the greenery was gone. Hillsides that had once been lush collapsed into dust. The final straw came in 2006 when a massive landslide buried hundreds of king penguins in Lusitania Bay. Years of erosion caused by rabbit grazing had destabilized the terrain. 
What had once been one of the island's most important penguin colonies was now a disaster zone. Scientists visiting the island were stunned. A place that had once brimmed with life was now a wasteland. Some of Macquarie's rarest plants existed only behind fences. Several bird species teetered on the brink of extinction. The chain of destruction had spiraled beyond control. Cats introduced to kill rats had decimated birds instead. Rabbits introduced as a food source had eaten the island bare. The rats and mice that started it all continued to thrive, unchecked by any natural predator. What scientists were witnessing wasn't just ecological damage, it was a full-blown trophic cascade where a disruption at one level of the food web sent shockwaves through every other part. By 2007, Macquarie Island had become a global cautionary tale. But it also became the site of one of the most ambitious conservation projects ever attempted. The goal? Total eradication of every invasive mammal, every rat, mouse, and rabbit. Not a few. Not most. All of them. It was a massive undertaking, with an estimated cost of over $24 million. The plan involved a combination of biological warfare, chemical intervention, and canine precision. First came the virus, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, delivered via carrot bait in the island's worst affected areas. It worked fast. Within months, the rabbit population plummeted. Then, helicopters blanketed the island with over 300 tons of poison pellets designed to eliminate rats and mice. But poison alone wasn't enough. To protect scavenging birds from eating tainted carcasses, teams of workers spread out across the island, collecting thousands of dead animals by hand. Still, the biggest danger wasn't what they could see, it was what they couldn't. Even a single surviving rat or rabbit could restart the cycle. That's when the elite team arrived, 12 specially trained detection dogs and their handlers. These were not ordinary animals. They had been trained for months to sniff out the faintest traces of rodents. One dog, a Labrador named Wags, became the face of the mission. With handler Melissa Hatton, Wags explored every corner of the island, from steep cliffs to underground burrows, searching for signs of life. The dogs cover more than 90,000 kilometers, equivalent to circling the Earth twice. Every positive scent led to an investigation. Every cleared area was marked. And in late 2011, the breakthrough came. Deep in a remote valley, Wags found the last surviving rabbits, a mother and her young. The discovery was a relief, but also a wake-up call. If one family had survived this long, others could be hiding too. So the search continued. More dogs were brought in. Teams worked day and night. By 2013, months had passed with no new detections. Still, no one wanted to celebrate too soon. After all, it had taken nearly two centuries to cause this much damage. Restoring the island would require absolute certainty. On April 8, 2014, Macquarie Island was officially declared pest-free. For the first time since 1810, not a single invasive mammal remained. It was a milestone in conservation history. But the question remained, could nature recover? The answer came faster than anyone expected. Almost immediately, plants began returning. Seeds that had been dormant for decades began sprouting. Tussock grass grew tall again, reclaiming hillsides once stripped bare. The megaherbs, like Macquarie cabbage, began spreading without fences. Even the two orchid species, once confined to tiny protected zones, were found growing wild across the island. The recovery wasn't just botanical. The birds returned too. White-headed petrels rebounded. Blue and gray petrels, thought lost from the island, established new colonies. Penguin populations rose. As the birds came back, they brought nutrients with them, guano enriched the soil, helping plants grow faster. More plants meant better cover for nests, which meant more birds. The island entered a positive feedback loop of rebirth. By 2024, 10 years after the pest-free declaration, the transformation was breathtaking. Scientists found that some bird populations were growing by more than 10% each year. Tussock grass was so dense and tall that researchers had to hack their way through it. Beneath the greenery, penguins carved tunnels like secret highways. And the once rare plants were thriving in places they hadn't been seen in generations. Perhaps most astonishing of all was how quickly it all happened. Experts had predicted it would take up to 50 years for the island to recover. But within a single decade, nature had roared back. Macquarie Island, once a symbol of environmental collapse, had become a beacon of hope for conservation around the world. Inspired by this success, countries like New Zealand have begun applying the same eradication strategies to other islands, including larger, more populated ones like Rakura, Stewart Island. 
what began as a local crisis is now guiding global policy. Still, the island's safety remains fragile. Today, Macquarie Island is protected by strict biosecurity. Every ship is inspected. Every backpack, boot, and crate is scrubbed and searched. Specially trained dogs scan cargo for the faintest trace of invasive species. The cost of prevention, scientists say, is nothing compared to the cost of letting history repeat itself. The story of Macquarie Island is one of catastrophe and redemption. It proves that even the worst environmental mistakes can be corrected. That humans, while capable of great destruction, are also capable of great repair. So what can we learn from Macquarie Island? That when we act boldly, patiently, and with science as our guide, we can give nature a second chance. And sometimes that's all it needs.